It's my pleasure to uh, begin this uh, event, uh, the Eakin Lecture, uh, Winter 2016. Uh, our guest speaker will be Kit Dobson, but before uh, I turn the mic over to Will Straw, the director, to introduce our speaker, I'd like to take the uh, time to thank the Eakin family uh, for their generosity in supporting activities, in particular at MISC, but across the university, uh, and in particular for funding the visiting fellowship that makes this lecture possible. It's a, a very fitting day to uh, uh, hold this lecture. Uh, it, ma it marks the 14th anniversary uh, of, the, of the passing of uh, Mr. Eakin, uh, the individual for whom uh, this particular award is, uh, is named and designated. So let me uh, ask Will Straw, the director of MISC, to uh, introduce our, our guest speaker, uh, Kit Dobson. Thank you. Good evening. Um, as Interim Dean Meadwell said, my name is Will Straw. I'm, for three more months, director of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. Um, and this is a bittersweet moment for me because this will be my last introduction of an Econ Fellow. And it's been one of the great pleasures of the total of six years that I've served as a director. And once again, I just want to give my thanks to Gail, who's made this all possible. Um, so I'm very, very pleased to um, introduce Dr. Kit Gobson. <laughs> Kit Dobson, who's giving the 2016 Econ Lecture. Um, Kit has been in Montreal for much of this school year, and it's been a great pleasure getting to know him both in our respective offices and in a couple of bars on Saint Laurent Boulevard um, and so on. Um, Kit Dobson is, is an associate professor in the Department of English at Mount Royal University in Calgary. He's the author of the important monograph, Transnational Canada's Anglo-Canadian Literature and Globalization. He is the editor of the book, Please No More Poetry, the poetry of Derek Baudieu, and the co-editor of the book, Transnationalism, Activism, and Art. And with Smaro Camborelli, he's published a book of interviews with Canadian writers under the title, Producing Canadian Literature, Authors Speak on the Literary Marketplace. Um, Dr. Dobson's work is, is some, it's some of the work in Canada that is very much um, producing the most kinds of innovations in the study of Canadian literature. It is really interesting and interdisciplinary, and I say this as someone who is not a literary scholar. He's a member of the board of the nonprofit Edmonton-based publisher New West Press. His current research project is a book-length study of malls, consumerism, and shopping as a practice of everyday life and his exa examination of this encompasses Canadian literature, art, and film. So I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the 2016 Winter Eakin Visiting Fellow, Dr. Kit Dobson, for the lecture, The Cultures of Consumption in Canada, Retail Therapy in Downtown Calgary. All right, thank you so much all for being here. As you were coming in, this is the playlist of some of the music that was on for those who were here a little bit earlier. <clears throat> These are all songs that are connected in one way or another to malls and shopping by Canadian artists. <clears throat> so strip malls, says the character Madison Weiss in Todd Babiak's Edmonton-based novel, The Garneau Block, are, as she puts it, the Future of World Cuisine. Now, Babby Axe is a rollicking novel, and it includes a number of reflections on malls and on Edmonton suburbs, as well as an ill-conceived trip to West Edmonton Mall by one of the book's main characters that ends up costing him his job. What is the future of shopping? Is the future of cuisine, in fact, to be glimpsed in your local strip mall? Even though Madison Weiss is being sarcastic in this passage, some sort of truth appears to underlie this statement. For all of its changes, challenges, and horrors, what good might the mall do? Where does it take us that we haven't been before? The malls take us to many places, but ultimately, I find that they often take us back home. When we go shopping, we can simply tell a friend or a coworker that we're going to the mall. It's an interesting phrase, going to the mall, especially because it uses the definite article the instead of the indefinite article a, uh, which you would think would make more sense, unless we then go on to specify which mall we're talking about. But we don't need to do so. 
In the North American culture of the last 50 years or so, we simply say that we are going to the mall, or even that we're going mauling in some cases. In this context, the mall expands beyond being a specific mall. It is in instead a sort of universal space, the universal mall or the mall as the universe. Our local malls, love them or hate them, connect us across space and time because we can all go to the mall, even though we might, each of us, be going to different malls, different shopping spaces targeted at different demographic groups, at different socioeconomic brackets, or whatever. Now, while I don't really believe that anything is universal, there is nevertheless this universal push in the English language. We all go to the mall, even if we don't. Montrealers, I've been learning this year, tend to say that they, they don't go to the mall. <clears throat> so thank you all very much for being here today. Thank you for your generosity in taking the time to listen to me and to join in a conversation about consumerism. I'd like very much to thank the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, its director, Will Straw, who's been a fantastic host to me since I've been here. Uh, also, the folks who work at MISC, Mercedes, Petros, Clelia, Monica, and Sarah D'Onofrio, who's been working as my research assistant this year. It's been fantastic to receive the support of the Eakin Fellowship. I'd like also to acknowledge the traditional indigenous lands that we're on today, traditionally Mohawk and Anishinaabe lands. Now this talk connects to my current project, which is a nonfiction book manuscript that I'm completing about shopping in Canada, and that has involved, for me, travels across the country. <clears throat> now I want to emphasize the nonfiction nature of this project, as it's pushing me to situate myself in a different way than a more traditionally academic project might, and it's pushing me to look for connections well beyond the academy. So in this project, I find myself wending my way via the mall back home to Calgary, too, to the, to the city from which I am absent while I learn more of what Montreal is all about. So today, I'll be talking about Calgary. I'll be doing so via two films that will take me to a recent work of nonfiction and through my own travels as well. <clears throat> the Calgary that I left when I was 18 years old and then returned to when I was 30 no longer irks me in quite the way that it did when I was younger. Perhaps I'm less angry now, and I realize that the world is a far more complex place than I can possibly know. It's a better state of mind to inhabit, at least for me. I am, these days, more prone to seeing the bigger picture behind consumer practices rather than being caught up in blaming individuals for their actions. So writing my project has been, in its own way, a form of retail therapy, however, questionable a term that may be. And it's been a project that has brought me back home to Alberta and to the sometimes progressive 21st century Calgary that I'm proud to live in. Today, Calgary is a warm place, an inviting one, where there are new possibilities in the air, even as the oil industry falters. We are starting to learn that we are going to have to do things differently in the future, and just perhaps, we might be realizing that we will need to work together to do them differently, too. The mood may be grim, but there is also a sense of change. Already before I left for Montreal, I felt something different in the air when I was walking around the downtown core. Now that the city has a progressive Muslim mayor, something that would have been well-nigh unthinkable in the Calgary of my youth, an NDP provincial government, ditto, and a Trudeau back in power federally. <clears throat> Maybe I'm just invigorated by the political pendulum swinging back toward a direction that I favor. But I just can't quite feel as gloomy about the times as some feel. At the same time, I'm not as optimistic as others. And here I have in mind uh, Calgary writer Aretha Van Herk, who's recently uh, written a piece for the CBC that uh, is perhaps more optimistic than some people are feeling. At a minimum, I can see that the big systems in place are made up of many flawed individuals, beautiful individuals too, trying to do their best even though they may fail. Somehow, that eases the pressure a bit, even while it makes it all seem impossibly complex. So when I was in high school, my friends and I often used to go to downtown Calgary after school, which was nearby. It was one bus ride away, or else a short sea train ride, if we chose first to walk through northwest Calgary's Kensington neighborhood. <coughs> 
Upon entering the city's above ground network of buildings, connected by corridors above the roads, the network that's known in Calgary as the plus 15 system, we would head to the food court in the buildings connected to Calgary's Eaton Center, which has now been restyled as part of what they're calling the core shopping center. So it was high school and I was always hungry, always. We would go to a local Chinese takeaway and get ginger beef, which I've been told is a Calgary specialty. I can't find it in Montreal. <clears throat> it's a Calgary specialty in that blended Chinese Western cuisine in which Western Canada specializes. And I immediately think of some of the work on food in Canadian literature uh, by, for instance, scholar Lily Cho, who gave a talk organized by the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada yesterday. <clears throat> a huge serving or more of ginger beef would disappear with surprising speed down our teenage gullets. And we would laugh and enjoy being downtown in a space that was not quite the mall, not suburban like the other malls, suburban being a terrible put down in my lexicon at that age, even though I was yet to read Jane Jacobs. <clears throat> yet at the same time, it very much remained a space for consumption. Thereafter, we would head next door into the Devonian Gardens, an indoor tropical garden with tables, benches, and out of the way nooks designed for folks to take a break from the daily grind of office towers, during their lunch breaks, or amidst the hustle of shopping. From our hormonally teenage point of view, Devonian Gardens was also a really good place to make out, with some spectacularly secluded benches couched within the obscure corners of the foliage. As a way of ending the school day or of cutting class, this ritual simply could not be beat. Now, Calgary's culture is like Canada's, and not just urban Canada's, I'd like to contend, but also stretching beyond the cities in which most Canadians live. It is a culture, in part, of shopping, of malls, and of consumerism. Being able to shop and consume is one of the ways that we mark ourselves, from the brands that we wear, or else boycott, through to our ways of identifying our class and cultural loyalties. Take, for instance, the scene in the film Fubar 2. This is the film poster for this film. I was thrilled that it also is on a can. <clears throat> So take the scene in the film Fubar 2, when protagonists Terry and Dean, you see them there on the beer can, go to West Edmonton Mall. The Fubar 2 is the sequel to the film Fubar, filmed and set largely in Calgary. Fubar and its sequel are mockumentaries that display the lives of two headbangers, Terry and Dean, who go about their lives in blind incomprehension, <clears throat> drinking, smoking, and generally messing around. The first film revolves around Dean's treatment for testicular cancer, which is the source of many low-budget jokes. In the sequel, <clears throat> Terry and Dean begin to take on more adult responsibilities. They go to work in the oil rigs of Fort McMurray, laying pipe and doing odd jobs. While they are there, they are exposed to the range of dodgy behavior that Fort Mac cliches are made of as we watch their longtime friend Tron's self-destructive, crack-fueled death run take its course. One result of Terry and Dean's move to the oil patch is that they find themselves suddenly to be wealthy. <clears throat> so they buy a big truck, get a house in complicated romantic lives, and they party on their time off. The pinnacle of their success is a trip that they take to West Edmonton Mall. And for these relocated Calgarians, the height of arrival, the sign that they have finally made a mark, is to travel to the mall. They stay at West Ed's Fantasyland Hotel, and we see them taking in the highlights of the mall, like the waterslide park. For these two headbangers, the most significant cultural mecca is indeed the mall. Now, this moment marks the highlight of their careers in the oil patch, and we see things come apart thereafter. But the moment of pure bliss of being in the Fantasyland Hotel is seemingly complete. Terry and Dean are transfixed by the fantasies of late capitalism, and for a moment, not only do they buy into it, but they live it. It is, no matter how cynical I try to be about it, a pretty good moment for them. A shopping and consumption can indeed mark class transcendence or arrival, as Terry and Dean achieve at West Edmonton Mall, if only for the briefest of moments. The spaces of shopping and consumption seem to mark their own transcendence of their old class structures every time that they are renovated, 
like snakes shedding their old skins. When I return to Calgary's Plus 15 network now, some 20 years after my time in high school, everything has changed, but everything has also stayed the same. Eden Center has had a complete makeover and is now linked to the TD Center and Holt Renfrew, making a bid at high-end consumption. Everything is bright white inside, yet the vaulted galleria above, not dissimilar to Toronto or Montreal's Eaton Centers, allows in a good quality of light, making the place welcoming enough. Now, somewhat incredibly, the old Chinese food restaurant that we used to go to is still there when I check. It was owned by the father of an old classmate 20 years ago, and I wonder if I could track down a lost friend by asking to see the manager. Devonian Gardens are there too, but the plants seem sparser after the garden's recent renovation. There are more places to sit, more of an open-air courtyard feel to it, but far fewer places to snog. And perhaps that's on purpose. I imagine that many, mess, many less good things could have happened in the dark corners of the gardens as well. I find it hard to put my finger on what it is, though, that feels different overall about the place, the Plus 15 network in downtown Calgary overall. Of course, part of it is that I'm different, too. Although it was at times busy then, Everything used to empty out by about 5 p.m. Now, there are more people who live downtown and immediately around the city's core, so the hours have shifted. Of course, I'm much older, my hair is starting to gray, and I have kids of my own. But there's a different quality to this place, too. One tangible difference that I can feel is that of mobile phones. I didn't have one when I was a teenager. I didn't have one until just a few years ago, in fact. And while some people did have them, they weren't so much the norm as they are now. Now, I think of the idea of circulation as it has been developed by the McGill Institute's own Will Straw. And I think about how mobile devices enable different ways of thinking about space. This increase in mobile devices has other consequences for malls, which no longer, for instance, tend to have clocks in them. Older malls, those from the post-war period, were often built with a central town square in them, in part based upon the work of early mall planners and designers like the socialist Austrian emigre Victor Gruen, who wanted suburban malls to replace or replenish the fading function of town squares in the downtowns of American cities. Postmodern malls built from the late 1970s onward tend not only to obscure their entrances, as analysts like Frederick Jameson and others have noted, but they also strive to exist outside of time. In most malls, you'll be hard-pressed to find a clock. They are the exception rather than the rule. My experience is that clocks are disappearing from our lives, or at least public clocks are. I know how to check the time when I'm out in the city because I gave up wearing a watch years ago. Billboards, parking meters, and public phones are all places to look. Schools, universities, and public offices tend to have clocks in them as well. I feel like there may have been one once upon a time in Devonian Gardens, but I'm not sure. These public timepieces are now disappearing. We are privatizing time. Everyone's mobile device comes equipped with an extremely accurate chronometer. And now that I, too, have my own mobile device to be reachable in case of a parenting emergency, I'll never need to ask anyone for the time again. Now, as a result, we lose the ability to ask a stranger to share a valuable piece of information. But, on the other hand, mobile phones give folks a good way not to have to have undesirable exchanges in malls or on the bus. And recent studies have suggested that, in fact, many, many people use their mobile phones for precisely that purpose, to avoid speaking with others. And so, without visible entrances or exits, and suspended outside of time, I walk through the labyrinth of hamster tubes that connect the shopping opportunities of downtown Calgary bathed in the glorious prairie sunlight that streams in through the plate glass windows overhead and on all sides. Even while it sounds dystopic, I'm surprisingly content. There is, however, an edge of threat. One of the pieces of cultural work that got me started on this entire project that I've been working on now for some years is another film set in Calgary, the film Way Downtown. <clears throat> Released in the year 2000 and directed by Gary Burns. It was actually released in 2002 in the United States. Its release there was held up by September 11th. Now, Way Downtown is my favorite Calgary film, and it's discussed often enough by Canadian film critics. 
I might assert that it has entered the minor canon of Canadian indie cinema. That film also explains the final track that I was playing prior to this talk when you all came in, the track Office Towers Escalate from Metric's 2015 album Pagans in Vegas. That tune, the tune itself is a low synth groove. It's something sort of just beyond the ambient muzak that you might hear in the elevators of downtown. I like the pun on the word escalate in the title. Office towers not only have escalators in them, escalators were an important invention when they came along as a means of creating three-dimensional display areas, but escalators are always connected to escalating something, too. At a minimum, the demand that capital always be engaged in growth, you can think of publicly traded companies having the duty to return profits to investors, and hence mandating constant growth, is but one form of escalation. The escalation of anxiety and depression in the contemporary workplace is another form of such escalation, and the stakes always seem to be getting higher. So the stakes in the film way downtown are pretty high too. The setup of the film is simple enough. It stars four young 20-somethings, starting with protagonist Tom, there we see him, office mates Kurt, Randy, and Sandra. Now these four all work together at the entertainingly named, but never explained firm, Mather, Mather, and Mather. They occupy the bottom rungs of the corporate ladder, and generally don't care much for their mind-numbing work, which seems to consist of little more than inhabiting cubicles with computers in them. Other co-workers flit through their days, including the vulnerable Vicky and the older suicidal Bradley, notably played by Don McKellar, all of whom seem to be doing an absolute minimum to get by. Tom's miniature ant colony, which he keeps in his cubicle, is an obvious symbol of what these workers' lives are like. In order to cope with the tedium of their employment, as well as to demonstrate that they haven't yet succumbed to their jobs as much as the corporate shills whom they see around them, the four main characters enter into a bet. The wager is a month's salary. These four young people all are unattached and unburdened, it seems, by serious material constraint. And the challenge is to see who can survive indoors for the longest. Now, it is possible for them to stay indoors, the film explains, because they live in a city in which the condominium towers are connected to the office towers, which are in turn connected to the shopping centers, restaurants, and entertainment complexes, as is indeed true of downtown Calgary. Now, the film never explicitly names it, but the city is very obviously Calgary, from the radio station heard during the film's opening credits, Calgary CJ92, to the Calgary Tower, which is visible in several shots, and to the recognizable map of the downtown core that is displayed. And when we join our characters, they've already been following their wager for some time. It's day 24 of their indoor confinement. The action takes place for the most part over that day's lunch hour. It is the day on which company founder, Mr. Mather, will be retiring, and there is a party scheduled in his honor for the afternoon. Each of the film's main characters is suffering different stresses as a result of her or his self-imposed incarceration inside the mall, office, home complex of downtown Calgary. Tom is increasingly worried that he has become a shallow, callous person who is inured to the suffering of others. He provides the film's voiceover, and we follow him most closely. He notes, for instance, that he no longer even breaks stride when people looking at their mobile phones or papers collide with each other. He's sarcastic and rude to others, and, at least at first, he feels little apparent guilt when he picks up a woman who works in a shop and, as a result, upsets the woman's boyfriend. He's also unable to feel sympathy for his cubicle neighbor, whom he dubs, sadly, I'm Bradley, the suicidal character played by Don McKellar. And Bradley shows us one likely future for Tom himself, although Tom does not seem to recognize it. At about the midpoint of his seemingly meaningless career, Tom says to him that he's halfway home, Bradley seems to have achieved nothing, and he brings a two-liter plastic pop bottle filled with marbles into the office, a bottle that should be weighty enough to break the shatterproof glass of the office tower and allow him to jump to his death. The marble-filled bottles provide a link to the name of the film. The worker who serves Tom his morning coffee tells him the following joke. He says, paraphrasing slightly, quote, what's the difference between the plus 15 and a bottle of marbles? Quote. 
Tom, who doesn't seem to care, doesn't answer. The server eventually replies, quote, the plus 15 takes you downtown, but the bottle of marbles takes you way downtown, end quote. Which is a way for him to refer to the suicide of depressed office workers. Tom, who is becoming worried about his own failings, realizes through the telling of this joke that Bradley's bottle of marbles is a sign that he is about to attempt suicide, and as a result, Tom rushes off to intervene. But Tom's dawning self-awareness self is not yet complete. He is also living in a mildly stoned state and has begun to have delusions. He imagines in one scene, for instance, a giant fish devouring his leg. The film is shot with yellow and orange tones, highlighting the artificiality of the indoors and making Tom, like most of the characters, appear distinctly sallow, as we see him here. Kurt's, care, Kurt's sufferings, in turn, are sexual. It turns out that the character Kurt has previously won a similar competition while he was a student at Carleton University. His challenge is what to do with his libido. He reveals to Tom that although he is engaged, his fiancée will not have sex with him until they are married. Their relationship, however, Kurt shares, is an open one, allowing him to have casual sex with others. He has not, however, been, as he puts it, quote, getting any, end quote. And his reputation for being smarmy seems to be well-deserved. This description of his relationship, as he describes it, is a far cry from a queer positive challenge to heteronormativity. He embarks upon a lunch hour tryst with coworker Vicky, whose own engagement has been dragging on unhappily for about the same length of time as Kurt's own. They go to the office women's bathroom in order to have sex, only to be discovered by their other coworkers. Kurt is unpleasant, perhaps superficially attractive, constantly chews gum, and throughout the film appears to be smug and knowing. Randy, on the other hand, seems to have his confidence shattered by the experience of being confined to the indoors. He spends his lunch hour hanging out with his friend Phil, a security guard who is in the habit of finishing other people's sentences. The two appear to share a strong degree of unresolved homosocial tension, and Randy wonders aloud whether he is becoming a bad person. When Sandra presents him with a request from the company to go and pick up a plaque to give to Mr. Mather for his retirement, he complains that the location of the plaque store requires that he go outdoors. He then convinces Phil to take him there inside of a wheeled garbage can so that he does not technically go outside and hence lose the bet. Now, the fourth character, Sandra, finally, appears to be experiencing severe anxiety and obsessive behavior after all of her time confined indoors. Assigned to follow company founder Mr. Mather during the lunch hour, he is an elderly kleptomaniac who wanders the stores of downtown, lifting whatever suits his fancy. She appears to suffer the most from the indoor environment and its conditions. Early in the film, Tom observes to her that the air in downtown Calgary is all recycled, and she begins to show signs of asphyxiating from the air conditioning. Individual shots zoom in on air vents, some of the shots dubbed over with the sounds of muffled screams. In a suppressed panic, Sandra becomes more and more distraught, at one point walking into a magazine store and stealing a perfume sample page so that she can smell something more pleasant. Later, as she tracks Mr. Mather, she finds herself crawling around on all fours in a clothing store in vain pursuit of the man, and at one point, twirling a revolving door to the outdoors so that she can try to catch brief gasps of fresh air. So the wager is taking its toll, and everyone, in short, is falling apart. The film turns increasingly odd as Tom begins to float along the mall corridors, as we saw him in that earlier shot. His clothes change inexplicably from one shot to the next, as do Sandra's, suggesting that this single lunch hour is representative of every lunch hour. Every single day in the mall is the same as every other. This bizarre lunch hour seems to separate these characters ever more from reality. At one point, Tom follows Kathy, the woman he has just picked up and who works in the mall, as she runs in distress after her boyfriend, Paul, whom they have just spied on the ground outside. At first glance, Paul appears to have jumped to his death. Tom stops himself at the do door to the mall, just before going outside where Paul lies. Now, although it turns out to be a case of simple malaise, Paul is lying on the ground in his sorrows because of his girlfriend's wandering affections, Tom wonders if he's losing it. 
His failing to go outside to help a fellow human being, a sign of becoming, as he puts it, some kind of, quote, psycho, end quote. And indeed, we can see in this moment that his confinement within the mall and within downtown seems to be separating him from reality. Does the experience of being in the mall remove us from reality or connect us to the bizarre dimensions of super-reality that we inhabit in our post-human moment today? Walking around downtown Calgary seems to confirm that the world is a strange one. The plants grow indoors, as opposed to in the largely concrete world outside. The time is always the perpetual present. And you have to go downstairs into the subconscious levels of the mall's strata in order to find an exit. I often depart from the obvious parts of the plus 15 system in my own meanderings. In the corners of the network, you'll find homeless people walking, staying indoors and away from the heat or the cold, depending on the season. The Arts Commons connects to the Convention Center and to the Glembo Museum, where the corridors exist in a state of perpetual dim light. As Calgary turns to a full-blown recession connected to the collapse of oil prices, Shops are going out of business, and closed storefronts are becoming more and more common. Right now, it seems that no matter what the government, banks, and businesses try, the economy will have no simple fix. Consumer confidence, as they call it, is low, and more people are in vulnerable states than at any other time in recent memory. The suicide rate has recently spiked by 30% in Alberta. I have friends who are out of work, looking to find the next opportunity, some not actually bothering, saying that there's no point. And the government is touting some version of a Keynesian model for fixing these issues through infrastructure works like the controversial pipelines that are in the news again right now. In the medium term, there is confidence that the price of oil will go back up. In the longer term, however, it seems to me that Albertans are, at some level, aware of the validity of the adbusters-esque critique that the economy is based upon unsustainable models of growth and will need to change at a fundamental level. Whether people are walking around in the shock of unemployment or in the days of the hyperconsumptive zombie, things are not quite right. And either way, you can see it on display in the mall. The lunch hour of the four main characters of Way Downtown seems to reel ever more out of control and toward the point of collapse. As the film becomes more surreal, Tom imagines that downtown Calgary has been picked up by an evil comic book style supervillain and taken into space. A recurrent non-speaking figure, a superhero in, in spandex and a cape with a pink triangle on his chest, runs through downtown Calgary. And things return to Earth, back to normal, once again. Piece by piece, however, a new order emerges. Our four main characters have cracked, and they are going to make changes. Kurt phones his fiance to suggest that maybe it's time to finally go ahead and get married. He is, at least on the surface of things, symbolically ready to grow up in spite of his faults. Thankfully, Bradley's suicide attempt fails. The bottle of marbles fails to break the plate glass of the office tower window, bouncing back and hitting him in the head, knocking him out cold. Just at that moment, Tom arrives and attempts to console him, taking responsibility for his own lack of concern for his co-worker's well-being. Tom then takes the bottle of marbles and places it in the box that was supposed to contain a valuable vase to be given to his boss at the retirement party. He gives the flowers that were also supposed to be for his boss to the still distraught Vicky, and then he walks away from the office, never to return. Sandra, in turn, decides to abandon the contest and opts to go outside. Once she's there, she spots Phil wheeling Randy inside his garbage can over to the plaque and trophy store. She takes the garbage can from Phil and wheels Randy over to a dumpster, where she leaves him. He eventually tumbles to the concrete. They're both, as a result, out of the contest. It is, if anyone is still keeping track, the smarmy Kurt who wins, but the cost is the loss of everyone's respect and friendship. As the film steps towards its conclusion, a very interesting technical shift tells us as much about the world of Way Downtown as any of the characters' actions. Now, Sandra is the first character who we see going outside. The horrid indoor air has gotten the better of her, and she steps out through a set of doors, doors that look to me like they're the ones in the cosmetics counter at the Bay's downtown store in Calgary, and she steps out onto the street. 
As she does so, filmmaker Gary Burns appears to make a very conscious choice to opt for a different look for this film, which is shot on video. Now, whereas the film has had a distinctly orange hue up to this point, with the characters looking very unwell indoors, the look of the film is distinctly different outdoors. All of a sudden, the colors of the film jump out, and we see what looks at first to be a much more vivid appearance of the human form on screen. The seeming relief, however, is short-lived. After a few seconds outside, Sandra looks around and sees the cars and buses driving on the downtown streets. The film's appearance changes again, now to the sort of grainy, blue and gray toned appearance that often characterizes documentary realism. This shift happens just as Sandra realizes that the exhaust spewing from the vehicles and buildings is rendering the air just as sickly as the indoor environment. <clears throat> She returns to the office. Take my word for it. I can show you later, perhaps. And back to the orange-toned film, and declares to Tom that both she and Randy are out of the contest. Tom, too, is subject to the same change in the film's appearance when he leaves the office and then walks outside. He steps into the air and takes a breath. Then, suddenly, a bottle of marbles explodes on the ground next to him. He looks up, and the film freezes in its final shot. While frozen, the shot progressively zooms in toward Tom's eye, and finally, reflected in his eye, we see a body falling. Some critics have seen the falling body as being that of Mr. Mather, who has just been given the bottle of marbles by Tom in lieu of the expected retirement gift. Mr. Mather has, after many years, finally made a macabre escape. Before he can fall, though, and while he is still reflected in Tom's eye, we see the silhouetted figure of the superhero return to catch the body and zoom off to safety. At this moment, the film ends. In the final analysis, it seems difficult to decide. Does Tom return to reality, to reason and balance, when he leaves his sickening office job? His voiceover narration suggests that this may be the case. Or does he live within a surreal or super real world in which malls and office towers are only one escalating part? Although Tom is now outside, the surreal superhero figure has not disappeared. In fact, he's more important than ever. He saves the day. The air outside, too, is hardly better than the air indoors. And even though the appearance of the film has changed for the outdoor shots, it's not as though the shots are, in themselves, any more real than the shots that came before. We're still in the world of the film, not in the world itself. So even though Tom, Sandra, and Randy have all stepped into the outdoors and left the mall, and Kurt is making symbolic plans to get on with his life, they are still confined within the frame of the film itself. And in turn, by the various shapes and strictures of the market practices surrounding the cinema, like grants, distribution, and so on, that ensure that while the system we, that we inhabit may not be a total one, it certainly is a totalizing one that contains us so very well in most of our day-to-day -day actions. Now my talk today ends in a slightly different place in time. On the 26th of December, 2012, with the, it's gonna take me to that nonfiction writing that I mentioned before. December 26th, of course, is Boxing Day. Now I returned, I moved back to Calgary in 2009, and it's taken me more than a few years to recalibrate myself to being back home. But I think that I'm closer now than I was when this project started. On Boxing Day 2012, I went not to the downtown core, but rather to Marlboro Mall, an unassuming mall in the northeast of Calgary. Marlboro Mall is notable mostly for its Walmart and its dollar stores. It is a low-cost, working-class mall close to where my partner's mother lives. We were there for an early Idle No More rally, for one of the flash mobs held in malls across Canada and the United States in late 2012 and into 2013 and beyond. Late in his book, The Reason You Walk, Wab Canoe describes the rise of the Idle No More movement, and he notes the, quote, beautiful moments of indigenous cultural re renaissance, such as flash mob round dances that took over shopping malls across the continent, from the West Edmonton Mall to the Mall of America, end quote. My partner and I had both been hearing about Idle No More online, and I had found out that there was going to be an event held at Marlboro Mall. Canoe, in his book, describes going to a parallel event on the very same day, but in Winnipeg. 
a passage from it, quote, on Boxing Day, Lisa, and that's Canoe's partner, Lisa and I went to the mall. I don't know more Winnipeg had called for a flash mob round dance, an urban take on the traditional friendship dance of the plains. The mall was crowded enough, but the halls were impassable as we approached the main square. Pushing through the wall of people, I saw familiar faces smiling and mouthing hellos. Christmas greetings were exchanged. When the time came, I found my way to a group of singers I had traveled with on the powwow trail in my late teens and early 20s. The drums kicked in one after another, falling into the boom chicka boom rhythm of the round dance. It continues. One singer kicked out a lead, and all of the other singers grabbed it, following the melody he had set with an explosion of sound. Chills went up my spine. As I sang, I looked around at hundreds of people joining hands and sidestepping to their left in time with the beat. I felt the power around me, the power of the drums, the power of the voices, the power of community. This, to me, is the key achievement of Idle No More, the flash mob round dance. Our cultures were marching back into the public spaces and the national collective conscience. We are still here, we are still strong, we are never going away. Don't call it a comeback, we've been here for years. End of that quote. Our Boxing Day experience was similar though different in important ways too. The event in Calgary's Northeast was loud, rowdy, and celebratory. Held immediately next to the mall's food court, a few hundred people flocked together with seeming spontaneity, prompting the security guards to throw up their hands and just go with it. Drummers began a beat and singers followed suit. There was a round dance, but because of both the setup of the mall and the sheer number of people pressed into a small space, it was difficult for it to keep moving. And it wasn't without its tensions, either. A man in a wheelchair, for instance, tried to get through the crowd, frustrated by the obstruction of the ramp that he needed to access in order to proceed. But it was a celebratory and defiant atmosphere, and my daughter, up on my shoulders, took it in. Everyone whooped and hollered and drummed, and then, just as quickly, dispersed. A few weeks later, I participated in another round dance in front of Calgary's City Hall with two colleagues. Later in the winter, I joined an Idle No More rally in Edmonton at the provincial legislature. I followed along and supported while I could, but the event on Boxing Day is the one that has stuck with me. Canoe, in his description, is part of the community, part of the crowd. He's among friends and he is greeted by others as such. My partner and I did not share such an easy communion with folks on that day. Although she grew up in a working class Métis household, our years away from Calgary and in the world of post-secondary education mean a new process of forming connections to community. I am also not of Indigenous heritage, and so I want to be cautious and respectful in how I strive to be an ally to Indigenous struggles, though these struggles are important ones to me because I now have many Métis relations through my partner. The challenge of how to participate in and be part of community in late capitalist culture remains. Idle No More situated a huge part of its work, specifically in malls, and that too is a source of some of the unease that I felt. There were tensions with reports that some malls did not wish to have indigenous protests hosted there, not dissimilarly to how the Mall of America was recently criticized for attempting to ban a Black Lives Matter rally. The mall observed that because it is private property, the owners had the right to dictate how the space is used, something that provided that one respects the regulations of capitalism and of ownership, is difficult to deny. But the round dances took place, and community was generated through the connections made and affirmed in malls. So can we come to the mall and find community today? Bizarrely, and against my expectations, as I conclude, it seems to me that in limited ways we can. The nightmare scenario of way downtown exists in contrast to the Idle No More flash mob. While the mall is a private space, and so the owners have the right to dictate how we exist in those spaces, that does not mean that we have to obey those dictates. I hope that we might obey some of the rules. When I visited the Mall of America, for instance, I approved of the signs banning guns in the mall. But we might take a page from the French thinker Michel de Certeau, who argues in the practice of everyday life that rather than seeing late capitalist culture as a carceral world of regulations, norms, and surveillance, as his contemporary Michel Foucault often did, we can also sometimes see it as a world of transgression, 
one in which we make use of spaces in ways that were never anticipated. De Certeau is keen on finding small acts of sabotage in the daily operations of workers, in discovering how people deploy everyday tactics that lead to change, in finding the cracks in the system that will still allow for creativity to flow. The public squares of earlier cities were not simple spaces of freedom either. Many gatherings and protests in public spaces have ended badly. But when an idle no more flash mob shows up suddenly at the mall, it may be a violation of mall policy, perhaps. The round dance has already started, though, and it's too late to stop it now. Community is forming in the mall, and it is and will remain a site of contestation. For all of the control of contemporary capitalist and consumerist culture, humans are too divergent for us to be able to predict everything perfectly in advance. A good thing, too. Among the many reasons that this is so, it means that if I am presented with the choice between whether to wear a blue tie or a red tie to work, like Tom is in Way Downtown with his ever-changing wardrobe, I can choose neither, or even both, find the exit, and walk out and into the sun. Thank you. Are Canadian please. malls different? Please say more, Will. I'm interested in that idea. So the question is, are Canadian malls different? Well, in relationship to seasons mm -hmm. and so on. I mean, do they have a relationship mm -hmm. to the cold? Or, um... Um, I think of a mall, um, the mall in Espanola, Ontario. Um, I was driving by this uh, over the summer, and there was, a, there was an ad for the mall on a billboard, and it said, the weather's always great inside. So. Uh, yes, I think that's part of it. The other thing I've heard is that um, Canadian malls apparently on average um, generate more typical revenue per leasable square foot than malls in the United States tend to. Um, and apparently uh, this was one of the, part of the logic that uh, Target was looking at when they decided to expand into Canada. So there are differences apparently. Thanks a lot for your talk. Um, I wondered if you could talk a bit more about, at the very beginning of your talk, mm -hmm. you described a, that a kind of sense of transition mm -hmm. that in Calgary, for mm -hmm. example, in the, in the context of the current mm -hmm. oil price slump. Um, and you've also described malls as being a place where you can sort of sense maybe a sort of collective affect or, you know, mm -hmm. almost the, the kind of pathology of, or the contemporary sense of almost like taking the temperature of, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the kind of collective sentiment in one way or another. And so I wondered if you could talk more about what, where, what you, if you see, what are these moments of transition that give you optimism or that make you optimistic? And what does that look like? Mm -hmm. in the malls, I mean, what, what, what really, what do the malls, what are the malls in Cal, you know, Calgary and Alberta sure. especially looking like these days? Mm -hmm. um, and what do you see there? Sure. And, and any other kinds yeah. of, I mean, just to add on that, when your discussion of Idle No More, I wondered if there was any kind, if you could imagine the mall as a site of protest or kind of public coming together mm -hmm. now to try to, try to figure out what to do with the economy, which clearly is, you know, hit yeah. a kind of period of stagnation that I don't think we've seen for many decades. Mm -hmm. And you'd think that the mall would be a place where people might, you know, it'd be interesting to think about that people coming there to try to, you know, hold some time of, even if it's a kind of collective grieving or, for sure. you know, griping or, you know, yeah. commiserating yeah. or. Yeah, no, thank you very much, and that, that's a very rich set of questions. Um, one of the first things I think I, I should like to say is, um, I think my own understanding of Calgary is very much an idiosyncratic one, um, and I would really hesitate to speak for Calgaryan sentiment in general. I think it's, uh, my sense is that there is a lot of um, 
you know, conversation right now about what the future is going to look like, and uh, it's certainly not an uncontested future in any sense. Um, I know policy-wise, our federal government now is very interested in thinking about climate change in particular in a different sort of way, and this is going to have impacts in Alberta that are very active conversations on the ground there. Um, again, what that future is going to bring, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I do know that the, you know, the mood is grim. Um, talking to my friends back in Alberta right now, um, yeah, I, mean, I, I have friends who are out of work, friends who are looking for work, and so I, I mean, I'm very fortunate that I'm not. Uh, and I need to recognize the privilege that comes with that. Um, but yeah, the, the, the mood is uh, decidedly grim. In terms of the idea of the mall uh, as a space for coming together, and the, the mall is a space where uh, community groups and organizations do come together um, regularly all the time. I can think of, um, certainly, I, I know, um, it's fairly common for sort of parenting groups to meet in malls or for walking groups to get together to meet in malls. This partly speaks to your question, Will, about the weather. Um, and so in winter, people will meet in malls in order to be able to walk and, and simply exercise. Um, but community organizations sometimes will meet in those spaces as well. Um, <clears throat> I think the Idle No More piece is interesting because um, when Idle No More came to the public consciousness, this seemed to be the, the space that that consciousness sort of uh, arose in was around the, these disruptions to the spaces of shopping where there's this contestation. It's, of course, this long historical process uh, through which the spaces of consumerism have shifted from being more public spaces. And you can think about er sort of earlier markets in city squares, or you can think about uh, shops along streets. If you think uh, about, for example, um, it's uh, Saint Hubert, I'm thinking of, which is the, the, the glass-covered street here in Montreal, um, where you're in public space when you're walking along Saint Hubert, and there's shops you can walk into where you enter into private space. But when you walk out onto the street, the street is interestingly it's glassed over. At least the pedestrian section of that street is glassed over. And if you want to think about some of the the ways in which earlier malls evolved, one of the ways to think about it is so take that that glass frame, glass and steel framing, and run it all the way across the street so that the street itself is covered, and now you've got a space that remains a public space for now. But you know, later on in history, and this is you know, into the history of the post-war mall in North America, when companies decide to build those spaces as these already enclosed total spaces that private companies held, those spaces become private spaces. So I think we're, you know, we're accustomed to thinking you can go to the mall, it's sort of a public place where people can gather, but that history has been one of privatization and enclosure. So that it, it's still, I think, in, our, in the public consciousness, and I'd be interested in other people's thoughts on this, uh, kind of fuzzy. It's a private space that we think of as being one we can all go to in much of our sort of everyday thinking. So it is a space that, you know, that makes it appropriate for something like I Don't Know More or Black Lives Matter to show up in those spaces because it is something that uh, assumes many of the functions of things like town squares or those public spaces in many North American cities. Thank you for your talk. Um, you ended with community mm -hmm. and um, I'm think, I guess my question is, I'll just state it right off the bat, is how does the mall uh, stack up against other forms of, other spaces of community? Mm -hmm. um, and just to sort of play out this question a bit farther, I'm thinking of um, the street, mm -hmm. you know, where neighbors get to know each other, or the school, where kids get to know each other and parents get to know other parents. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, and then I'm thinking of things like collective experiences, like a course, a university, right, where mm -hmm. people live something together and so achieve community that way, or summer camp, you know, where mm -hmm. you, uh, my son's going to summer camp this summer, it's a transformative experience with other, other children. So uh, is part of this project, might I think, or you know, then there's chat rooms and so on. So mm -hmm. um, how does the mall stack up against other potential sites of community? Is it uh, a low space of community? Is it a high space of community? Um, yeah. Sure, thanks Eli. Uh, can I embarrass you for a moment? Sure. <laughs> well, <laughs> he said sure, so I'm going to go for it. Uh, I'm, I'm, when you mentioned streets, I immediately thought of you and me uh, marching in 2003 in Toronto in protest against war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, 
which was a, a different era. Again, walking down the streets and you know, you're able to say on the streets, whose streets, our streets. I can't imagine doing that in a mall. Whose mall? <laughs> not, not my mall. Um, <laughs> so I, I mean, I think th those different spaces are really important to acknowledge because they, they have very different things uh, th going on in them. Um, I think one of the things I hope that this project acknowledges is that in a number of locations, the mall is the available space for communities to form. Um, and I'm thinking partly of um, Jane Jacobs, who I referred to briefly talking in the uh, Death and Life of Great American Cities. She talks about the idea that the only way for, in her analysis, the only way that malls can function, and here I'm thinking of sort of the you know, large suburban enclosed malls that characterize much of post-war suburban growth. She knows that the, the way that they function is by holding a monopoly on commercial land use, and so a particular type of space, and you know, that, that if there are other commercial spaces in suburbs that the mall can't actually function in the same way because people will then be able to walk to things in their community and so on. So a lot of suburbs were designed with this idea that you know, you're gonna completely separate out commercial space and throw it into one location. And as a result, that's, that's the marketplace that people go to. So I think in many communities, that does end up being a really important civic gathering space, but I think it's very different from, from one place to the next, for sure. Mm -hmm. is the setting and it's a place of wonder and romance um, and mm -hmm. even in the recent Todd Haynes film Carol that's a little bit whereas malls very quickly became associated with zombies and uh, mm -hmm. mall cop comedies and so on and there's a kind of abject in that respect mm -hmm. I mean is, are there representations of malls in film or literature that present them as magical places of possibility? Oh that's a good stumper. Yeah, I'm thinking of films, of course, like Dawn of the Dead or Mall Rats and so. Well, Mall Rats is somewhat optimistic. Kevin Smith's film Mall Rats because you know they, they go to the mall. And there's this idea that it's their mall, um, that's sort of this important space where community does form. Uh, but maybe flip it around and think that a lot of the Elf. Elf? Yeah, there you go. Elf. Well, the Elf is a department store. Elf is also though it's, that's connected to the department store history and Miracle on 34th Street, all that, those kinds of things. Um, uh, I, I feel like I want, no, I want to push, no, 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 I, I want to, I just want to push back against the idea that the department store is depicted as a bucolic space. Um, I'm thinking of Emile Zola's novel, uh, The Lady's Paradise, which is sort of the, one of the first uh, works that's set in a department store, and it's about the rise of the department store, and it's very much about gendered exploitation as being something that comes with the rise of the department store, so we, we, we can nuance that in several directions, I think. Someone here. Never. And I appreciate your um, optimism and choosing to see the best in mall spaces. <laughs> um, we've talked a lot about uh, class stratification and what, those, what that does to community spaces. And I've heard you talk about the mall as either a place of, you know, where that's evacuating community mm -hmm. because it's not public or as a place of hope where people can gather. I'm curious about the class stratification of um, communities that do gather in the mall. I grew up here in Montreal going to the Cavendish Mall, mm -hmm. <laughs> which we call the Schmall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you grew up there. And it was always a place that, of alienation mm -hmm. for people that can't buy things. Right. You know, you go there because your friends are going there, but you're required to go shopping in order mm -hmm. to be there. And so if shopping isn't something that you have access mm -hmm. to, it's a very alienating public space. And you haven't really put that in between yeah. there. I know you think about it, so I wanted to sort yeah, of ask you. Yeah, for sure. No, thank you, Neva. Um, and there's a number of things we could say in response to that. I think one of the things about... Um, you know, it's obviously a strategic choice to choose to see the optimistic side of things. And I think one of the things that's um, useful to note in the process is that you know, malls, like anything else, are historical artifacts. Right? They, they're here now. They will look a bit different in the future. They, they will not exist in the distant future. And you know, the world changes and moves on. And I think that, that's an important thing to note. But I, one of the things I think about, um, thinking about questions of class and community, Nava, um, is uh, some work that was done at the Dufferin Mall in the 1990s. Dufferin Mall is a mall in Toronto. It's sort of in the west end of central Toronto. Uh, for, and some of you here may know it. <clears throat> um, it's a space that had uh, a number of, uh, sort of similar to what you're describing, I think, with a lot of uh, youth coming to the mall and not having the resources to be able to shop, but spending a lot of time there, uh, and there being significant tensions within the community about what, you know, what these young folks were doing in the mall. Um, 
rather than trying to simply police that space, that mall experimented with doing things like introducing um, community literacy initiatives, after school programs, and things like that directly into the mall itself, uh, and had met with some success in doing that. Uh, that's only a partial answer, but I think, I mean, there, there are, you know, ways in which different spaces have tried to think really consciously about that. Other spaces simply try to police it out of existence. So hi everyone, um, as Kit Dobson's Eakin researcher during his time here at McGill, uh, I'm glad to be able to thank him on behalf of McGill, the Eakin family, and everyone here today. I can say that it has been a pleasure to work with you, Professor, and I truly hope we can work together again in the future. Um, it was a very interesting lecture, I think we can all agree on that, and it's now my honour to give Dr. Kit Dobson this gift on behalf of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. Dr. Dobson, thank you very much. Just like to take a moment to promote our next event. We've got to have